You have to hit the season just right to catch a glimpse of this aquatic organism. On this episode of The Paw Report, we head underground to check out the burrowing crayfish. Stay with us. Finding a solution for your pet's behavior problem can be confusing. Dr. Sally J. Foote helps you help your pet. Private consultation and resources are available at drsallyjfoot.com. Foot and friends, better bond, better behavior. Fetcher's Pet Supply on the north side of the Charleston Square is serving the EIU community since 1991. Fetcher's welcomes all pets on a leash, is open seven days a week, and offers made in the USA food. Pet supplies for dogs, cats, reptiles, and fish. Fetcher's Pet Supply in Charleston. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Paw Report. We're doing something a little bit different on the episode today. Normally, we uh, spend a lot of time talking about dogs and cats and snakes and turtles. But today, we're going to talk about something a little bit different, and that is burrowing crayfish. And we have two special guests joining us on the episode today, Dr. Chris Taylor and a graduate student from the University of Illinois, Caitlin Bloomer. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having uh, definitely a topic that we've never broached before, but as I, uh, when I was talking to you prior to our interview, I said we do all kinds of different topics and today is something that's very unique. So thank you both for joining us. Dr. Taylor, we're going to start with you because as new guests of the Paw Report, we always like to hear about the two of you and your background and how you got to love burrowing crayfish. Well, I am an Illinois native, um, born and raised in North Central Illinois. I was always drawn to rivers and streams. I was always be fascinated driving over a bridge and seeing flowing water. So I knew from an early age, I wanted to do something in the aquatic realm. And I went to uh, graduate school. Part of my graduate training was at Southern Illinois University and studied fish. <clears throat> After I finished that degree, I quickly realized that not many people were studying crayfish. And there was a real niche or an opportunity to learn a lot. And so I transitioned over to studying crayfish when I moved to the U of I and finished my PhD. And I, I, can, I can remember as a kid going out and playing in streams and collecting crayfish in cups and being mm -hmm. fascinated by how they looked. And I hear that story a lot from other people when I talk about crayfish. They say, oh, I remember collecting them as a kid and putting them in a cup. So uh, I was drawn to them somehow that I can't explain. But I've been at the, at the Natural History Survey, Illinois Natural History Survey, for about 28 years now and almost ex uh, <clears throat> exclusively studying crayfish. Not just burrowers, even those that don't burrow, mm -hmm. but crayfish for sure. Caitlin, were you one of those kids that <laughs> came across the, uh, the the crayfish and said, that's the, that's what I'm studying? So not as much. I grew up beside the beach. So again, I loved all marine and aquatic ecology. I did my undergraduate at Saint Andrew, or the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. But there's not a lot of crayfish species available to study in Britain or Europe. So uh, I'd done a little bit of crustacean work, but a spot was available in Dr. Taylor's lab to study crayfish in America. And I thought that sounded like a good opportunity. So it's been a year now and they are very charismatic, fun creatures to study. Mm -hmm. So we're having a good time. Well, let's talk about these charismatic and fun creatures. Uh, what are crayfish? I mean, I like to describe them as little lobsters, but we're not going to go down that path. Uh, what are they? Okay, so it can get pretty technical pretty quick on what's a crayfish, but we'll try it. I mean, everyone knows what a crayfish looks like when they see it, but what's the technical definition of a crayfish is an aquatic arthropod. Um, it's um, known as a decapod, and decapods include shrimps, crabs, and lobsters, and crayfish. They're in that group that have 
a hard exoskeleton. They're usually aquatic, although the burrowing crayfish we're going to talk about are almost semi-aquatic. But they differ from all those other, those other close relatives, the shrimps, crabs, and lobsters, by having um, <clears throat> basically pinchers on their first three pairs of walking legs and they do not have a larval stage. They have what's called direct development. So a tiny crayfish that falls off the uh, underside of a female when she hatches her eggs looks like a tiny crayfish. Those other things, the shrimps, crabs, and lobsters have a larval stage that looks very different. So they're, they're very closely related to lobsters, but they differ in that they're in fresh water and they, they have direct development. And they don't get a lot of attention. Um, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning of the segment, we do a lot of dogs and cats. We yeah. don't do a lot of crayfish. Yeah. So in general, they don't get a lot of attention, which I'm assuming is one of the reasons why the two of you, it was kind of a magnet for the both of you to, to come in and study them because the, the magnitude of their importance is pretty big and you're gonna get into that. Yeah, correct. I mean, that's, as I kind of alluded to earlier, that's something that drew me to crayfish is that my future PhD advisor and supervisor at the time said, you know, there's a lot of people studying fish. You should look at crayfish because there's not a lot of work being done. And that, and that was obviously turned out to be true. And that's what drew me to studying crayfish. So for sure. I think both of you will be able to answer this in your own version, but what is their influence on the ecosystem here in the, in the Midwest? I'll start with you, Caitlin, because sure. you're, uh, you're newly really diving into this and studying it and you've probably learned a lot so far. Yeah, so crayfish surprisingly enough have a really disproportionate impact on their ecosystem. For such small organisms they have really really big effects on the environment around them. So even just in the Midwest they have impacts through creating their burrows which can then help uh, structure soil, subsurface water flow, their burrows provide shelter for a range of different animals. Um, they're really important in trophic systems for a predator and a prey. Uh, a lot of different species eat them, not just people, even though everyone loves a good crawfish boil. <laughs> so they have a lot of different influences on the environment around them and they can have some really big impacts. Uh, you've mentioned, Caitlin mentioned the burrow and I think that's probably where we want to launch into now when we talk about burrows. That's their, that's their homestead. Uh, Chris, can you talk about the burrows and, and where they live and, and that intricate system? Yeah, so crayfish have varying degrees of burrowing ability. Most stream-dwelling crayfish we call non-burrowers, but that's not technically correct. If stream, crayfish that live their entire lives in a stream, if that stream would happen to dry up during a drought year, they have the ability to dig down into the soil, a very simple shallow burrow to, to keep their gills moist. <clears throat> crayfish need, they have gills, they extract oxygen from the water, but they, ha they can extract some oxygen from the air as long as their gills stay moist. And so non-burrowing crayfish, that, the types that you find in streams, technically can burrow, but those burrows are very, very simple and they don't spend much time in the burrows. They're only there during those dry drought periods to keep, try to f dig down into the water table mm -hmm. and find some moisture. The true burrowers build um, <clears throat> very extensive systems, um, sometimes very deep systems of tunnels and chambers, usually with multiple openings on the surface. And the true burrowing crayfish will spend almost their entire lives underground, uh, only coming out to find a mate um, and to find food. And probably 90% of their lives, they're in these deep burrows, and they're usually the only individual in those burrow systems. Very rarely will you find more than one individual in a burrow. And these burrows, again, can be very complex. There's reports of burrows going up to three meters deep. So if you imagine an animal that size, right. being able to dig almost nine feet into the ground, that's pretty amazing. That's one of the things that attracted me to burrowing crayfish. Everyone talks about beavers being the ecosystem engineers, well, that's, that's true, but when you think of an animal, an invertebrate animal that can dig nine feet underground mm -hmm. and live in that very complex system, I think that's pretty amazing. So the complexity and the size of those burrow systems is, is highly variable depending on which individual crayfish species you're talking about. 
I don't peg them, Caitlin, as diggers. <clears throat> uh, you know, we, we kind of define them. Well, you said they're this big and they look like a little lobster. So how exactly do they use their bodies, their crustaceans, I guess, if you will, to to form something that intricate. So that's really what makes burrowing crayfish so incredible is that they're small, but if you were to compare, say, a stream-dwelling crayfish that you'd find just from lifting up a rock, uh, the fingers on the end of their claws would be very long and skinny, and if you compare that to the claws of a burrowing crayfish, you can see they're a lot thicker, more sturdy, and that's what they'll use to push the, the soil up from their, their burrowing chambers. And so it really is those very tiny claws on this little creature that build these enormous burrows on, underneath the, the earth. So that's what makes them so impressive. How long does it take? I mean, do they, well, you said they spend their life mm -hmm. um, building. Do they ever leave and build again? I suppose if they were disturbed, quite often whenever we're going sampling for them, the most effective method to get a crayfish out is to dig up into, into its burrow and to actually get the crayfish mm -hmm. out of its burrow. So sometimes their, their burrows end up being pulled apart. And if you leave a crayfish back into where, where you've pulled it up from, it will then go build a new burrow relatively quickly. Interesting. Now, Chris, do they prefer different soil types, which we have in yeah. Illinois. I mean, we have very muddy, we have very clay, we have very sandy. Yeah, so um, that relationship is not set in stone. They have a lot of variability of what types of soils they can live in, but there's, there, there are some types that they just cannot live in, and that is sand, you mentioned sand, soils that are very sandy, in soils that are very loosely compacted, like really soft mud. And the reason for that is if you start to dig a burrow into loose soil type like sand, the burrow is just gonna collapse in on itself. So it has to have some clay uh, or some other soil texture types to keep that burrow intact. So they'll generally avoid really, really soft um, soil types, like that soft mud that hasn't been compacted in, in sand. But outside of those two, you can find them in a variety of soil types as long as there's enough moisture in the soil. So that's the key thing is that as long as that soil is close to some permanent or semi-permanent body of water, um, that will keep them, hold them to that area more so than the soil type. Because again, they need that moisture to keep their gills moist to extract oxygen. So if, if it's a high area that doesn't frequently flood and the water table is 10 or 20 feet below the surface, you're not gonna find a burrowing crayfish. They've gotta get into that moisture. It, piggybacking off of speaking about soil, um, they play, the little creatures play a, a very important role in the development of water structure and soil structure and that, that's that's amazing to me, again, given a creature that is so small. Can you talk about what impact that they play on that? Yeah, so I think one of the most beneficial things they do is aerate the soil by building these deep these tunnels, sometimes up to an inch and an inch and a half wide, and they're bringing that subsurface soil up to the top, uh, the, the chimneys that, mm -hmm. um, that right. you frequently see. That's, that's soil from deeper down coming up and, 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 and um, exposing it to the so uh, air. Mm -hmm. And so it's aerating the soil. It's creating, as Caitlin mentioned earlier, it's creating habitat for other organisms that will move into the, and use those burrow systems. Um, that soil that gets moved up from deeper areas of the, the tunnel or the chamber then allows different plant species to colonize that newly exposed soil. So it had, those burrows can have an extensive impact on what someone might look at and not normally think of as an aquatic habitat, um, but it's, it's structuring the, you know, what soil, what level that soil is at, what kind of plants can come in and colonize in those newly exposed areas, and then of course, you know, there's benefits to aerating the soil and then creating habitat for other organisms. So they, they have a tremendous impact. <clears throat> and that leads to my next question is, all those other creatures that kind of hop in those burrows, one of which is snakes. They, they very much enjoy them. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So there is actually a whole genus of snakes, the Regina genus, that have specialized to hunt crayfish specifically. And quite often species from that genus you'll find uh, hibernating in the, the crayfish burrows over winter. There's a range of other organisms that would also use their burrows. There's the crawfish frog and some other amphibians, a huge range of insects. Um, and there was actually a study done back in the 90s in some crayfish burrows. They found up to 20 different species within one burrowing system. So they really can support an awful lot of life beyond just the crayfish that have built them. How many different species are there of crayfish, burrowing crayfish? I guess we could start with the Midwest and okay. then we can whittle it down to Illinois. And and I guess me and just my curiosity, I'm I'm interested in central Illinois, yep. just around, you know, our area, because we do have a lot of waterways around here. Um, so Midwest, there are about 40 total crayfish species, and it, it depends on how you're going to define the Midwest, but let's say Ohio to Iowa mm -hmm. and Illinois to Minnesota, to the upper Midwest, there are about 40 species of crayfish. Seven of those are what we consider kind of the primary burrowers that spend most of their life in these extensive burrow systems underground. Illinois, we have 25 crayfish species in Illinois, and six of those are what we consider to be primary burrowers. So, you know, a little less than a, you know, a quarter of the species are true burrowers. Are they considered threatened? Um, I guess given humans, they, they could be. And I mean that, I don't mean that as a joke, I mean that as, you know, people are building an infrastructure and roadways and uh, all kinds of things that you can think of threaten their habitat. Yes, definitely. So uh, there's anthropogenic impacts from people developing urban areas that infringes on their habitats. They're having issues with climate change, losing different areas of water to, to increase temperatures. So they definitely do have some difficulties to face uh, in terms of what, what's affecting them right now. You could probably expand upon that. Yeah, well, yeah. So um, they are most certainly impacted by what Caitlin alluded to is, is habitat change. Habitat change is the fundamental threat to almost any organism. We're, you know, we're taking a natural land area and converting it to an urban area or a parking lot for a, a big box retail store. Obviously a burrowing crayfish that needs access to the right soil, mm -hmm. the right hydrology, and you know, the right exposure to open air is not going to get that under asphalt and concrete. So development certainly has had an impact on um, some crayfish. Um, <clears throat> invasive species are a bigger issue for lots of other aquatic organisms and some of the non-burrowing stream-dwelling crayfish are, have been dramatically impacted by invasive species. However, the burrowers have so far avoided that impact because they've kind of escaped those um, traditional pressures and threats that you would find in a water body and have crawled out of the stream and started to colonize and inhabit areas up out of the stream and started digging these burrows to get down, so into the, down into the water table. So, so far they've uh, avoided any direct impact from invasive species. So, so habitat change absolutely, um, you know, you see what an organism needs when you look at where we go to find burrowing crayfish. If it's developed in an urban area or it's had its hydrology drastically altered for drainage reasons, either for agriculture or development, it can certainly have a, a dramatic impact on burrowing crayfish. I'm very interested on how you go about studying these little creatures. And I know you both have done it. You've done it extensively. <coughs> Caitlin, you are in the middle of doing it. Unfortunately, with the pandemic that we're currently in, some of that has been put on hold. But how do you go about studying these creatures, especially if they're burrowing way underground to get to them, to study them? 
So it's definitely not an easy task. I mean, the most effective way to get hold of a borrower is to dig up its burrow. And sometimes you're maybe only having a 20% success rate at getting them out the burrows. So it definitely takes a lot of time and manpower to, to study them. But recently we were in Arkansas looking at a specific burrower up there, Cambaris Kazii. And we mentioned earlier that they really like floodplains and low-lying areas to get access to the, the moisture and the different hydrologies down there. This one's a little bit different in that it's found uphill in the Ozark Mountains. So we've been studying its habitat requirements and trying to see why it's being more successful in an upland area compared to other burrowers that are found in lowlands. So, so sample size, for any scientific study, you need a large sample size <laughs> to do. run any kind of analysis with. And for burrowers, it's, it's, it's much more difficult because you can go to a site and spend four or five hours and end up with three or four individuals. So it is challenging to get the sample size, but one of the things Caitlin's working on is, um, I mean, one of the fundamental needs for conserving a species is understanding what it needs for habitat, what it needs to live and survive. And a lot of her project and some other student projects are trying to empirically document, does it need closed canopy forest? Does it need open prairie areas? Is there a soil type perhaps that it needs? Uh, and then building um, mathematical models to, to pull that information in and say, okay, it needs X amount of sunshine or slope or waterfall, and then projecting that model onto the landscape to try to find new areas to go and sample to see if we can find new populations of the species. Um, a lot of it is just basic biology. What do they eat? What, um, what eats them? So we've done some studies in the past looking at stomach contents of crayfishes, trying to figure out what they eat. It's a, it's a complete, completely understudied area to understand for most crayfish species in the U.S. what, what they need to live, what they, need to, what, what they eat, what they need to find mates. So there's just so many research opportunity areas. Um, you know, we're, we're just scratching the surface with some of the types of projects, looking at habitat requirements or diet needs for crayfish. When you, when you accumulate all of this information, <clears throat> uh, who do you share it with? What do you ultimately hope to accomplish by gathering all of this information? And that really, I think, is an answer for both of you because you're in different stages of your professional careers. Uh, so a big issue with crayfish is a lot of them just lack any sort of life history data. We've been reviewing life history for burrowing crayfishes recently and uh, nearly 20% of them are still listed as data deficient under the IUCN red list. So that's a huge proportion of the crayfish that we just don't have enough information about to even be able to make a convincing argument for their conservation. So that's hopefully the aim with gathering these habitat requirements and other life history traits with them that we can push towards making sure they're protected, they have safe areas to build their habitats in, and we can improve the populations of the crayfish that are currently struggling. Yeah, and so um, there's a scientific community that needs that information and then from a management side there's state agencies that are you know mandated to manage their natural resources and so a lot of the places where our information will go is state like Department of Natural Resources for example mm -hmm. um, they need to know what a crayfish what habitat it needs to live in what it needs to eat um, what kind of interactions it has with other ecosystem members for, for them to properly manage and protect the resource. So mm -hmm. a lot of that information, so there's a whole wide audience. Um, management personnel at the state and federal level, scientific community uses that information then to continue studies into different directions. Last minute here, um, and maybe the public can help, but if somebody sees one of these chimneys and mounds, you know, people have ponds and lakes and creeks on their property and they may not know what it is, but you two obviously do. What, what can they do um, to maybe help, help conserve and help the habitat and not stomp on it? <laughs> 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 or what can they do? Because you know people are out there that have yeah. seen these. Certainly. Do you want to take a... 
I mean, definitely if you find crayfish burrows, uh, you can contact your DNR, your environmental protection agencies, and if it's somewhere they have been finding endangered crayfish, people will come out to take a look and see, see if that's what you've found. Uh, we have people email us at the office with pictures of crayfish in their backyards and uh -huh. pictures of burrows saying, look, look, look what we find. So we do always like to, to find new, new places that burrowing crayfish have been discovered. Chris, last word? Yeah, I would say don't think they're a bad thing. There are some situations where burrowing crayfish might have a negative impact on your land. They're digging a hole, but look at it from a broader perspective that that burrow is creating habitat for other species and helping the overall general ecology of your, your area. So don't, unless they're really impacting your life on a daily basis, just appreciate the diversity. <laughs> excellent, uh, an excellent piece of advice to end our conversation today. So Dr. Chris Taylor and graduate student at the U of I, Corinne Bloomer, thank you both for joining us, talking about burrowing crayfish. So a very interesting topic to say the least. Appreciate the time. Well, thanks, thanks thank for you. having us. You're yeah. welcome. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Paul Report. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode and we'll see you again next time. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Power Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Fetcher's Pet Supply on the north side of the Charleston Square, serving the EIU community since 1991. Fetcher's Welcomes All Pets on a Leash is open seven days a week and offers made in the USA food. Pet supplies for dogs, cats, reptiles, and fish. Fetcher's Pet Supply in Charleston. Finding a solution for your pet's behavior problem can be confusing. Dr. Sally J. Foote helps you help your pet. Private consultation and resources are available at drsallyjfoot.com. Foot and friends, better bond, better behavior.